Welcome to the Salton Sea State Recreation Area, your starting point to a magical Salton Sea experience. Here at the Visitor Center, we have all the information you'll need to explore and enjoy the state park, plus learn how the sea came to be. So sit back and enjoy our video. Uh, the big idea of the project is that it's a um, it's modular. It's um, it's deployable by a couple of people. No part weighs any more than about 150 pounds. So um, one person or two people can lift up each part. And so rather than being a big boat that needs a marina and um, and a lot of infrastructure to get it on the water, uh, this thing pa flat packs uh, like a piece of IKEA furniture, left minus the instructions, uh, on a 16 foot trailer, and we. Is if we can get near the water, um, we then carry all the pieces to the water and assemble it at the water's edge and can, can launch it pretty much anywhere. And so it's, it's agile in a way that, um, that a lot of boats aren't. Uh, it's also powered by the sun, it's solar power with an electric motor and so it generates as much power as it needs. And so it's uh, kind of a little bit of a perpetual motion machine as long as we have the sun and all of our systems keep working. So with the conditions right, calm weather and full sun, we can motor all day, work all day out uh, on the water and then have, um, have as much energy or more energy than we started with. Uh, 
other big idea of the platform is it's a it's it's a platform it's a it's a vehicle that allows people to do work in places that people don't normally go and so Steve and I's interest is um, is the making of that structure. Um, so it's a thing in itself, and we're proud of and excited about what it is as a thing, but what we're, we're more excited about is it as a, uh, a vehicle or a propellant for other people to get to places. We're helping people get to places to do things that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise without this. Uh, and we built this for the Center for Language Interpretation to expand their programming, um, where, where and how to, to activize and make that, you know, the highest and best use of this uh, of the platform, so we're starting to think about other bodies of water, um, whether it was uh, former mine, you know, open pit mine um, pits that have filled in with water, or other inland seas or lakes or um, places that that didn't have a recreational uh, um, culture or audience, uh, but that still were fascinating and worth looking at. And here we're, we're super excited about Salton Sea for its complexity, that it's a place that doesn't have an easy answer or one story. It has many stories and um, it's a bit of an ecological paradox. It's, uh, there's no quick fix uh, and there's also no quick disaster. It's, it's, it's all of those things together and it, it, it's gonna take um, people uh, talking through a lot of difficult issues and, uh, and a lot of difficult um, uh, like there's difficult science ahead, there, and I would argue there's different, difficult aesthetics ahead as well. I mean, a kind of cultural response to this is partly why we're in a, an art context with this, uh, bringing the humanities to bear on the questions rather than just the, the, the scientific uh, enterprise. Uh, and so this body of water is, um, is fascinating for us on that, on that level, that it was a used, former used, formerly used in a military capacity, in a recreational capacity. Why would you do that? Yeah. Like if you were looking for stuff in the water column, oh. the fish and stuff. Oh, I see. But our, um, we just, things just change. Our interest here with this project is to, um, to we're gonna bring a, a side scan sonar unit it, um, and image the bottom of the basin and so what, what once was a dry basin that had a memory of water that's now a wet basin with this murky water we're curious um, to see what's down there and we're less interested in the kind of spectacle of um, the crashed planes for example or the the kind of event based things or the, the needle the needle in the haystack is a little less interesting to us than the the conditions of um, of human and land interaction and so for example to see a, a, ter a terrain, a subaqueous, an underwater terrain modified by the impact of a, of a bomb, an explosion, that's fascinating. And so mapping that um, with our sonar, uh, imaging that, providing um, the ability to see what's, um, what's down there or some version of what's down there is, is our primary interest. That and also spending time on the water, that and part of our interest in these uh, extreme environments that are out of the way and off the beaten path is people don't go there because it's not easy to be there. As an architect who um, is committed to both the discipline of architecture and also the education of not only architects but people in the humanities, artists, art historians, writers, um, even, I mean, everybody, I'm committed to education. Um, I have a very wide definition personally, and I'm just speaking for myself here, a very wide definition of what art is. I think it's cultural expression. And so um, we, can, we can find it in poetry, we can find it in music, we can find it in, in, in the making of images. Um, we can find it in, in all of these things. And, and then we can evaluate whether it's significant, worthwhile, interesting, um, I mean, I think that question about you know whether it's um, good or not good, whether it has relevancy and has a life beyond its just thing, is is another bit. So um, I'm less hung up in wearing the badge of um, uh, of this as art or us as artists. And I think Simpark is pretty interesting in that way, where they operate as artists, but they also uh, like utility. They like things that have have other forms of engagement with the world. 
And so uh, in terms of explaining to people, you know, they want to walk by, some people think we're doing science, some people wonder, you know, are kind of, they think, they think a great many things. Uh, from my perspective, that's, all of it's fantastic. Uh, that the takeaway is that we're looking deeper into this basin, into the Salton Sea, into the conditions out here, and we're committing our time and the fabrication of this um, this craft that operates kind of as an off-planet mission, like we're um, we're in our own um, in our own sphere of, of survival, of taking care of ourselves. There's no you know quick rescue or any of that, um, and and that becomes legible to people. And, and for me, that's the other that's the bigger story that's actually way more interesting and, and also um, has gravity relative to um, like whether whether people think it's art or not is. In certain rooms, in certain circles, that's important. But um, in terms of the people that we've been encountering walking on the beach, um, uh, it's clear for most of them that we're serious about what we're doing, and, and that's what's more important to me than, than putting uh, a particular label on it. Uh, hi everyone, welcome. My name is Chad Dawkins. I'm the Curator and Director of Exhibitions for the Southwest School of Art in San Antonio. Uh, I'm here to introduce you to a uh, juried exhibition here at Luca and Lubbock. It's called Town and Country. Uh, this exhibition is part of the Texas Painting Symposium uh, hosted by Texas Tech University that has been rescheduled for the fall. Uh, given the situation, everything was already here and is up. So, luckily, we're able to put together this video to show you so I want to start by thanking uh, Guy Fromeau uh, at Texas Tech, Joe Ardano at Texas Tech, Linda Cullum, and all the staff here at the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center uh, for putting everything together, asking me to put together the show, um, and the symposium will be amazing once it happens in the fall. So I want to go through and talk a little bit about the work here in the show for you, and give you a brief tour of everything. So first we have this piece by Catherine Allen. Uh, this is a uh, as you can see, almost photorealistic painting uh, where she's come through and chopped up the landscape in some way, and then we have this demolishing building. Uh, see, given that I picked this work in late February, early March, I feel like everything has a little bit different tenor than it did uh, then. This one definitely is still my first place choice for the show. Here we have Elaine Palowitz. Uh, this piece is just incredible to me. The flatness, the little cow, the way she treats the landscape, I think this is hilarious. I think it's a very uh, successful way of thinking about putting together a landscape. It kills me. It's great. This one, John Chen. Uh, John Chen, I've known his work for many, many years, decades. He's an amazing man. He makes amazing paintings. These things are tiny. They're glossy. They're super fine. Uh, the, the touches on them are just, I don't know, so refined and so delicate. It's great. The picture of a ruinous something out in the world out of the landscape. Next we have Haiti Cisco. She's from San Antonio. She does these paintings on paper. Uh, the economy of effort, the economy of uh, material speaks to this subject matter, which she takes from the sides of buildings, uh, hand-painted signs, all these sorts of things that we see in sort of architectural vernacular. I think that's sort of a common theme uh, throughout this show is what you can find just out in the landscape. But as you can see, these things are emblematic of what they would have been found on and the purpose in which that place would have served. But I love them as a set. Um, they're so uh, 
soft, gentle, and, and yet just really worked. So I think that's a great one too. This huge piece is by Adam Farkas. Adam Farkas is in Texas Tech here in London. Uh, as you can see, large uh, fabrics or bed sheets, curtains, something like that, which says they don't speak for us. Again, now in April, it seems like everything, uh, the, the, the thinking surrounding everything has changed a little bit. Upon seeing this, it made me think of the, the time that we live in, protest posters, these sorts of things that we would see all around, which have become emblematic of the country in the last couple of years. Now it reminds me of a huge mask, for some reason, uh, walking in. But to me, it's a powerful piece, both in terms of scale, again, with the ingenuity, of uh, the simple uh, facts of the, of the fabric, and then this you know, wonderfully precise uh, letter work on it. I think it's a great piece as well. All right, now we'll move into a little bit of abstraction, a little bit of portraiture. First up, Anthony Garnica from San Antonio. As you can see, Anthony is recalling the, the fine tradition of, of abstraction and formalism in painting, uh, doing these large sort of forms all together and pressed within this composition. Next to it is a little gem of a piece by Sean Campbell Austin. It looks like a gem. It's also so small, super precise, super crisp. It's really great indicative of Sean's work. Here we have Emily Potts. This is a digital rendering of a sculpture that she had created previously. I like to think of this in terms of how one could construct digitally in the same way that one could construct uh, with a brush or with a, you know, a, a, a trowel or something like that. Lauren Yandel, this is another beautiful piece that's collaged together with different painted elements which then have been painted on. Uh, on top of and all put together again in this small, neat little package. Here we have Casey Galloway, also of San Antonio. Uh, Casey's working with these dyed, natural dyed fibers, putting these together uh, into this uh, woven tapestry form here. Again, recalling much of the history of abstraction uh, in a Western tradition. Here we have Jessamine and Potts. Uh, Jess's work, uh, sort of messy interiors. Boisterous brushwork really overriding on the on the surface of the, the wood here, showing us the, the sort of um, tumultuous inside of an interior. I think we can easily draw some metaphor from that. And we're all stuck inside now. Jane Cornish Smith, the weighty mantle. This is a, a woven together uh, piece of in, in, encaustic and new paper. Uh, you know, it looks like a big bathrobe. And, once you get inside of it, become a part of it, it's soft, yet it's also somewhat off-putting because of its scale. It's a nice mix of all these different elements of composition, form, and then with the color. Next is Hannah Dean. I've known Hannah's work for a while, also using these small squares, working this 8-bit pixelation version of, uh, of seeing reality that we've all become so accustomed to, especially those of us born in the 80s. Here's Birthday Boy, it's a little boy here with his birthday cake. You can see it way better far away than you can close up. And next is Sky Rudin. Sky Rudin uh, graduated from Texas State University in, in San Marcos. Uh, Sky's work, full colors, uh, deftful rendering of the figures. You can see here it's almost like uh, something is being woven into this other figure's head. Very strange, there's some stars almost indicative of a sky sitting out in this void. Lastly here on this wall, Rachel Black. Uh, Rachel Black here has a, um, given us a close-in portrait again of a birthday, uh, again of a family gathering, again of an interior. And what I think is most powerful about this piece is what we see in these eyes here and the, and the, the lack of gaze that's going on here. You know, candles we know are going to be blown out, but someone is here doing something, someone's looking at someone else. It just really draws together all those elements that we see in a photograph, especially of something uh, of a scene or of people that we don't know. So the, the contact between the familiarity and unfamiliarity, I think, resonates really strongly right now. All right, so last thing we have this piece, this is G. Jackson Tanner. <clears throat> 
What appears as a solid blue field or a somewhat mottled field is constructed of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of little pointillous dots of pure golden acrylic color. And so there's actually a mix of blue, green, white, red in here, all working together to create something like we would see in the sky, as we know that the sky is not just you know, blue because that's what it is, it's the way that the light interacts with our eyes. The same thing is working here. Uh, I know Mr. Tanner to be uh, an art handler, a preparator, uh, one of these fastidious types of people whom I'm most fond of in the art world. And it, it comes through shiningly in his work that we have here all put together. Again, harkening back to those traditions of painting over the last 120 years or so, everything, you know, through pointillism, impressionism, uh, up through harmonic abstraction, especially field, color field painting, I think can be found in this. So with that, I want to thank you for joining us on this short tour. Uh, I want to thank all the artists for submitting, and I want to thank all of you for watching the video. Thanks. to change a nation but you're biding your tongue you've spent a lifetime stuck in silence afraid that you'll say something wrong if no one ever hears it how we gonna learn your song so come on come on come on come on you've got a heart as loud as loud so why your voice be taken maybe we're a little different there's no need to be ashamed you got the light to fight the shadows so stop hiding it away come on come on i want to sing i want to shout i want to scream Put it in all of the paper. I'm not afraid. They can read all about it. Read all about it. it oh, 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 At night we're waking. Hi, my name is Demetria Williams, owner of Art by D. Will, located here in Lubbock, Texas. Right now I'm standing in my studio and I'm going to go ahead and show you a few of my pieces. I specialize in mainly portraits, but I can do a variety of things. I love embracing everything black and showing how beautiful we are. If you're interested in a piece, you can contact me on Instagram at I am Demetria or send me a message on Facebook. My Facebook is Demetria Williams. You can also purchase uh, paintings online and prints at artbydwill.com. Thank you. So come on, come on.
WTDR Dance Company.
Juarez, the characters. Sailor, a Texas boy just returned from duty with the Navy in the Pacific, is on leave in the port of San Diego. Juarez was like this kind of mystery that happened to me over a period of about five years, and it really built itself. A lot of the images and whatever came from traveling a lot back and forth between Texas and, and uh, California. But I always thought that the characters in, in, the, in Juarez, uh, you know, both the music and visually, they were always about climates. They're about climates kind of in motion and colliding with one another, whatever, more than actual people. The original, the first, uh, the body of drawings, the first body of drawings I did, uh, there were no people. There's no, if, you know, they're all, it's all landscapes and objects and uh, uh, kind of residue from incidents. And then when we left uh, uh, California for about five months in 1970, uh, I had a studio in Lubbock out on the Idaho Highway and uh, I wrote some of the first songs and the first drawings, and they really did come kind of at the same time, you know. Uh, and I was very conscious of not wanting the songs to be illustrations of the drawings or drawings to be illustrations of the songs, but it was like one s specific set of information on one side, another specific set with maybe the music on the other side, and what, what the piece was about was going kind of down the middle of it. Terry Allen's Talking Trees are part of the Stewart Collection at UCSD. He is a multidisciplinary artist in the truest sense of the term. In addition to his indoor installation sculptural work, which is emphatically mixed media, and his paintings, writings, and drawings, Allen is also a songwriter, composer, pianist, and lead vocalist who makes country rock records with his own panhandle mystery band in Lubbock, Texas. Allen has an installation that is part of Insight 94. I've kind of, um, since the beginning, had written in my notes um, across the razor, or across the razor. There was a show in, uh, it was called Insight 94, and um, uh, they invited 50 Mexican artists to show in the U.S. and 50 U.S. artists to show in Mexico, right on the border. I went and just did a visit, and I had no idea they were building a wall uh, at the time. And they had taken a lot of the uh, metal sheets that they were used for tarmac in the Iraq War uh, that were kind of left over. And and these metal sheets have started in the Pacific Ocean and had built, already gone almost 40 miles or something across, if, into the interior. I was shocked at the, at the, uh, the fact that we were building a wall. And, and uh, there's one little slot right off the ocean that uh, had a circular concrete pad with a a uh, monument kind of in the middle of a little pylon in the middle of it. And uh, so the, the wall came and stopped right at the circle, and then there was a chain link fence that went right up to that monument. But you, it was the only spot you could really kind of see the other side, see through if you were standing on the ground. But the monument was a, a testimony to the friendship between the United States and Mexico, you know. So it was like kind of the ultimate irony prick, you know. <laughs> and but that that image, and I started thinking about, well, I'd I'd like to have some kind of interaction between the you know Mexican side and the U.S. side. And I initially proposed um, two concrete blocks, one on each side of the border, uh, on the beach, right mm -hmm. down, uh, that were probably. 30 feet, I think, away from the wall on each side with a um, uh, sound system, a microphone speaker system in it, where that people could actually walk up and stand on this platform, this concrete, and 
speak to the other side. But when they started kind of testing the waters with the bureaucracies that they would have to deal with in terms of build, building this thing, um, they just kind of hit a brick wall with it. And uh, uh, so I, I tried to th think how I could still do the, have the same idea, uh, but something that wouldn't be quite as threatening to people. And I just basically put it on wheels. I put it, put, decided to build platforms on vans uh, with a ladder, for the, and, and they became this kind of mobile free speech units, or, you know. People came up, and I think because of because they were suddenly above, elevated, and they were looking each other in the eye, there was an eloquence that happened and a response, kind of a res responsibility that people took on that I never anticipated, but it, 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 was, um, it was actually beautiful what people said to one another.
Allison's family home. His family lived here during the duration of the 50s. The reason we have Jerry's house, the drummer for the Crickets, the Hollies moved around quite a bit, so we actually have a list of 13 different addresses that we do keep on file in the gift shop. So we're going to go through today, give you a few little fun facts, a few things to clear up if you've ever seen the Buddy Holly story, the film starring Barry Boosie in it, and a few other quick fun facts as well. So we're going to get started here in the living room. So if you have seen the film starring Gary Busey, you'll know that there is a scene where the crickets are named due to a cricket being in the wall of the garage. Now the reality was it was actually very popular at the time to name your group after some sort of bug or insect. The group was a big fan of another group called the Spiders. So the reality is they sat down in this living group with an encyclopedia of insect names, flipped through that, some of the names that they passed up on included the grasshoppers as well as the beetles. They ended up settling on the crickets because crickets make their own music. Now not everything in the house is going to be original to the time that the Allisons were living here. And there are two major reasons for that. One being there was a tornado in 1972. By that point, the Allisons were actually living up in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where Leigh currently resides. The remaining individual pieces that are original include the painting on the wall that was a popular paint by number done by Mrs. Allison, J.I.'s mother. There's a photograph on the wall of Louise Allison and her husband, J.D. that is also original to the living room. And we'll go ahead and head to J.I.'s bedroom now. J.I. did share his bedroom with his older brother, James, when their family first lived here in the LBK. He didn't have to share it for too long, so this bedroom actually became the location where Buddy Holly and the Crickets would write and record music a little bit while they were here in the Lubbock area. Now, the biggest song to have been written in this bedroom was Peggy Sue. Peggy Sue was originally titled Cindy Lou after Buddy Holly's niece and his sister. They did change the title of the song per request by a young J.I. Allison, and so it did become Peggy Sue later on. Now, the drum set here, this was a drum set that did belong to J.I. It doesn't date to when the crickets were together, and that original set, of course, no one knows where that is due to time. The second the boys had opportunity and the funds for something better, they went ahead and did that. J.I. did set this one up for us, uh, he did it the way he would have. The tom drum, which is the top drum here, is upside down. J.I. would do that purposely. That is the sound he liked. Over here against this wall on top of the piano, you will see a photograph of a young J.I. Allison for the Love of Kai Westerners marching band. You'll also see a New Orleans City limit sign. The story behind that sign is the boys went on a trip to New Orleans to hear real music. On the way back home, they noticed a New Orleans city limit sign. It appeared to be falling, so the boys went ahead, took it off, put it in the trunk, and brought it back home. Um, I've been told that if you ask J.I. about it, he will simply say the statute of limitations. <laughs> we'll go ahead and make our way here through the restroom. I'll meet you in the master bedroom. All the photos along the wall were donated to us by the Allison family in order to help refurbish the home. You will notice as looking through these photos, you won't see a photograph of Buddy in any of them. 
That is simply because they were all taken after February 3rd of 1969, the day he died. Um, the Here in the master bedroom, the biggest song to have him written was actually That'll Be The Day. That'll Be The Day, of course, was inspired by the John Wayne film, The Searchers. The boys went to see that film, came back here. Betty started to pace the bedroom, told J.I. they should write a song. Being funny, J.I. tried to impersonate John Wayne's line, saying, That'll Be The Day. Betty said yes. About 30 minutes later, the original country western version of That'll Be The Day was completely written. The rock and roll version that we know later was re-recorded, and that was due to some contractual issues. Uh, but anyway, it was written right in here. Um, and our final location is going to be here in the kitchen. Now here in the kitchen is where majority of the original pieces to the family are going to be located. Those include the dining room table and chairs, the wooden hutch against the wall, the glass grates and copperware, the kitchen sink, and the bottom of the island we built up from there. There's also going to be a phone against the wall. The phone itself is not original to the house, but it has the original shared landline number in the middle, if you are curious. So another fun fact to think about is there's also a scene in the Buddy Holly story starring Jerry Busey, where the boys are driving down what is supposed to be 19th Street of Lubbock, Texas, right out front of us. In the beginning of the video, you could hear some traffic going on, but in the film, there are mountains in the background. That's not a thing in Lubbock. It just happened to show up in the film. Well, thank you for coming on this tour with me today. My name is April. I am a gift shop assistant here at the Buddy Holly Center. We hope to see you all whenever we open up again. Thanks for coming along.
Let's put one back here. All of this wall space will be available for First Friday Art Trails. We have three different walls available. So I'm also taking applications for 2021. You can reach me at tbfineartphoto at gmail.com. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the future. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Laura James and I'm an artist and the owner of Studio 210 and welcome to my studio. So the artwork that you see inside my studio has been done by my students. I teach art classes starting with kindergartners and I go all the way through adults and we um, use mainly acrylics and oils, sometimes watercolor and clay. But for the first Friday art trail this month, I wanted to feature my fifth grade students. My fifth graders, several of them have been with me since I opened five years ago. And so I wanted to give an opportunity to feature their artwork before they moved on to middle school. students and I'd like to say a special thank you to Therese Barrett Photography for allowing us to be a part of this first Friday art trail. Hello Lubbock Contra Dance community. This is your caller Morgan here to give you a little reprieve from your social distancing and isolation. Today I'm going to be walking you through Family Contra in the Castle. This dance is by Seth Tepfer and it's in duple and proper. If you have never been to a Contra dance before and this is your first time and thought I'll click on the audio, don't worry we're going to walk you through it step by step. When you start lining up for a Contra dance it's nice to imagine the collar and the band at the top of the room, whatever you would like to set up as the top. And so imagine me standing at the top of the room facing you, and we start with setting up two long lines of couples. To my invisible left hand side, we start with a gent with his partner across from him. And then the next couple lines up underneath that gent. And so on the left hand side, we alternate and we have a gent, lady, gent, lady. It's all right if there's just two of you, and it's all right if there's four, even better. From here, we like to acknowledge you're in the right place. Your partner is standing across from you, give them a little wave. And the couple below you, if you're at the very top of the dance, those are called your neighbors. Go ahead and wave to your neighbor, a little hello. Before we begin, Let's make sure you know where you are. The very first couple in line of your dance is going to be ones, and the couple below them are called twos. All this means is that certain couples move at certain times, and this is also how you know which way you are progressing. Ones progress down the line while twos progress up. This dance is going to start in very easy formation, you're going to take hands in a circle and you're going to do what's called balance the ring. It's a very simple, you're all going to step 
forward into the circle, put your feet together, and step back out. This takes four counts to do, so it's going to feel like one, two, three, four. Step, step, back, step. You're going to do this two times in a row. Gets you to a total of eight counts. Still holding hands in that circle, you're just going to move to the left. You're going to circle left all the way around until you get back to your original starting position. From here, we're going to balance that ring two times again. Still holding those hands, we're now going to circle right all the way around until you get back to your original place. This takes eight counts. Next, you're going to let go of everyone's hand and you're going to face that neighbor. That neighbor is that person next to you that's not your partner. With this neighbor, we're going to do what's called a do si do. Facing that neighbor, you're going to walk toward them and pass by the right. Your right shoulders are going to breeze past each other. You're going to take about one step past each other. And then you're going to take one step to your right, everyone's individual right, so that you can back up on the other side of your neighbor and keep backing up past them until you can see them again and you're looking right at them. From here, we're going to move on to what's called a neighbor swing. We're going to make this very simple for your swings. I want you to take each other's hands and just in a lovely circle, just swing around each other in a circle, just a little, a little twirl. This will last eight counts. And when you're done with your circle, you just make sure that you put that lady on the, on gent, you put the lady on your right hand side. When you end the swing, you will be facing the couple across from you in those long lines. You're going to be facing back in towards the middle of the set. From here, you should be facing your partner and you will do a partner do si do. Again, the do si do is going to be facing that partner. You're just going to walk past them on the right, give them a little back to back with space and just keep walking backwards until you can see each other again. From here, still with your partner, we're going to do a partner swing. Just take those two hands again and twirl clockwise in a circle. I forgot to mention, swings are done clockwise. This swing will still end with the lady on the right, but since you are, you will be swinging in the middle of those lines you created, after this partner swing, you will face down if you are a one and up the line back toward facing your imaginary collar if you're the two. If there are only four people in your household, it's not a problem. Just turn to face each other and dance with each other again. If there's no one else there, it's not going to hurt anything. From here, we start back at the top of the dance. Stay tuned for a wonderful recording from our band old news banjos so that you can dance this at home and I will make sure to provide calling for you along with the music. We hope to see you again when this is all over. Balance the ring two times. Circle left. Balance the ring two times. Circle right. Neighbors, do si do. Neighbors swing. Partners, do si do. Partners swing. Bounce the ring two times. Circle left. Bounce that ring two times. Circle right. Neighbors, do si do. Neighbor swing. Partner, do si do. 
partner swing. Balance the ring two times. Circle left. Balance that ring two times. Circle right. Neighbor, do si do. Neighbor, swing. Partner, do si do. Partner, swing. Last time, balance the ring twice. Circle left. Balance the ring two times. Circle right. Neighbors, do si do. Neighbor, swing. Partner, do si do. Partner, swing. Cause I've been sleeping all night, not enough, not enough You've been running through my mind, catching up, catching up I've been reading all the signs, ain't a little to the right Are you thinking about love? Are you thinking about love?
little boy inside, but he's grown up tall and strong. Yeah, he'll shake your hand and he'll meet your eye, but deep down he won't belong. Listen to the other side, the other side There's no telling what we'll find Looking through each other's eyes, each other's eyes And leave the walls we hide behind I'll never know until I know What makes you hurt, what makes you glow Until we reach the other side I'm so sick and tired of seeing